today. We are happy to have you telling us about the geometry. Okay, thanks. Uh, so let me give some context of this question. So this is a um, couple of papers that came out in November and December uh, with uh, Federico, who is a former postdoc, and two grad students at uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, so the, 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 the context of this problem is, is, is following, is when we study QFTs and we try to consider various flows from some UV, to some IR point, often along the flow, you will get basically three fields that decouple. So these go under various names. For example, you know, often this is called when you have an accidental symmetry. Um, and, and, and so on. But in the context of doing something that we uh, that, that that we certainly enjoy, especially typically when the IR theory is strongly coupled, is we want to do some anomaly matching. And in many cases, these three fields they contribute to such an anomaly matching. So if you want to know what this what the anomaly that is in this IR theory, or if you want to know some more detailed property of this IR theory, if you can't understand how this decoupling occurs and, and what they carry away, this could be a, a hard problem. So the context, uh, and usually it goes under the name accidental symmetry because people usually just wave their hands and say, you can't tell when this happens. So, so, so you, you have to find other ways to study the IR theory. So in a, in, a, in a context where this becomes even more serious, is if we consider uh, in recent years, there is this program of trying to understand lower dimensional theories by compactifying on some Riemann surface with some punctures. And then you, here you can get a family of 40 theories. In this context here, you can see this as a RG flow from a 6D to 4D. And in, in, in this context, most theory that you get in the 4D here, they are non-Lagrangian, meaning you cannot construct a different 4D Lagrangian from which that flow with them. So typic the typical thing that we observe here is going to be non-Lagrangian theories. However, so, and in this context, trying to do an anomaly matching, and the way you typically do anomaly matching here is you consider the 6D theory which will have some A-form anomaly polynomial, which is going to be a function of background fields associated to the global symmetry. And you can, there is a prescription on integrating the anomaly polynomial on the Riemann surface to get a six-form polynomial, which you would associate as the polynomial of the 4D theory. In general, in this context, the, this object that you have will have two contributions, a CFT part, if there is a CFT, plus an I6 free, which would be the three fields that, that, that can decouple. So here, and just knowing this piece is actually part of defining what the possible 4D CFTs are. Is it clear? So when you have a smooth surface, it's, uh, I understand what this, integral of I, IA over sigma means, but if you have uh, some punctures. Yeah, so this we, in some papers that I wrote two years ago, we explained how to do this. Okay. Yeah, so, so the, the way you can think about this carefully, uh, the best way to do it is to think of it as a problem in, in, in M theory, for example, where you then have to work out the anomaly info problem carefully, and then the data in associated with this puncture, you can Resolve it in a particular way, okay. but the, um, okay. if it comes up, I, I, I can explain in more detail. Right, but in this, in so the, of course, when you have punctures, you can guess that you can have free field associated with those guys. But even when we consider a system with no punctures, from which I will discuss mostly today, 
um, there are many, many free fields that contribute. So if you don't know them, then you can't even define the anomaly of the, of the Lodi theory to, to try to at least make sure. So this is a broad context. And, and I will uh, restrict to a specific 6D theory today. I will consider 6D 1-0 theories, uh, which appear at uh, a stack of N M5 probing uh, C2 mod ZK uh, singularity. Okay, so such a theory has a large global symmetry. There is a G, which you have an SU2 R symmetry. It also have a, a U1 that come from some isometry structure. And then it has an SUK times SUK. Uh, uh, a global symmetry, which is which we will come back to later on how you can understand it. So this this theory has a very large global symmetry, and when we try to compactify uh, down to forty, uh, one you have to pick a topological twist. Here, so this means I pick a background for the SU2R symmetry, which is along the Riemann surface to preserve four supercharges. So this will break the SU2R down to some U1R prime, which will play, play a role. Also, another thing you can do in this, in this reduction is you can turn on background fields. What this means is if we consider a U1, uh, a background field F for some U1 in the 6D, right? So this would be a background field for pick this U1 to be either this U1, which is from the isometry, or a, a, a Cartan element from the non abelian part. This can be decomposed into two parts. There is a U1, which which would be a background for the 4D theory. And then you can add fluxes Ni times <clears throat> V sigma, where, where I should give a label. Let me give a list. Let me just do this. You can add some flux M over here with the constraint, the integral of V sigma on sigma is equal to one. So, now, when you do this reduction, when you choose a twist, then you choose a set of background fields. In general, we have this large global symmetry. Go ahead. Could you say again what the U1 was? Um, I, can, I will explain the U1 in a moment in the geometry. So, so let me, the way to understand the U1 is- U1 is the symmetry of the 6D theory? Yes, it's a symmetry of, of the 6D theory, and you can see it from the geometric construction. Here you have the CK same. Yeah. Yeah. So so you 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 have an SU2 left and an SU2 right. So you the, the orbifold is acting on SU2 left, then the left over the U1. Global non-non asymmetry. That's right. And then you have this R symmetry here. Okay. So the Okay, so in doing this, this, this reduction going from 6D to 4D, you pick a topological twist and that's fixed by supersymmetry. Um, and then for every Cartan element of the global symmetry, you can turn on an additional background flux. Okay, so what you get is in 4D, uh, you get a large base of theories which are going to be labeled by the 6D10, um, then is going to be labeled by a choice of 2K minus one flux parameters. Which I will denote as an I. Okay. So you have a huge family of 4D theory that just come from a single 
guy, and generically, the, the global symmetry of this is going to be, you will have some U1R prime coming from the R symmetry. So you, have a, you will have a U1R symmetry, then you will have a U1S coming from the original, and then you have a product of some U1, I will put beta I times, so this will be, K minus one of them, then you have another product of U1 gamma, and there's also another K minus one. But you, ha you have a, just from the single 4D theory here, you single 6D theory, you have a large family of four dimensional theories that are labeled by T, also the genus of the surface. Three. Four and also G, which is genus of surface. Okay, so you have an infinite family, a, fam a family which has infinite set of solutions, which is like, so, so now um, if I want to understand this class of theories, uh, the sort of most basic data you want to know is what are the anomalies and how do you understand the anomalies and how do you organize the anomalies? Um, Sorry, can I just, uh, shouldn't we also uh, discuss boundary conditions at the punctures? So, so, so the, very good. So in this talk, I will not worry about boundary condition of at the punctures. So I will put, I, I just consider smooth Riemann surfaces without punctures. Okay. The, the case for the young tableau is for n equal to two theories. For n equal to one theories, also for the general U1, it's a much more complicated problem is you have a much larger family of what punctures mean. So I will not even touch this. And the thing that I will point out, even at this level, there's questions that to, to answer on what is the anomaly of the lower detail. So we also have discrete global symmetry? You have, very good. There are discrete global symmetries which show up. Um, and for the sake of the time, I will not touch those. So the computation that I will do later can be adapted to also include discrete global symmetry, then you can talk about them. And I have a few papers where I explain how that works, but I will not worry about it. So here we'll just worry about the continuous part and the anomaly associated to the continuous. The anomalies also don't, don't include the, the gravitational or maybe- It includes the gravitational. So all continuous anomalies. These theories also have a description in terms of gauge theories, infrared limits of some 60 gauge theories. Um, so the 6D10, if you go to the tensor branch, you can, you can describe some, 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 some quiver, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, some, which, which, which you can study. Yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. But I, I will not go anywhere in the moduli space. The, the, the problem I'm going to be focusing on at the fixed point. Sure, if you go to the moduli space, so for example, the 6D theory, you can study the anomaly by think, going to the moduli space and understanding where you have some, some, some quiver, 6D quiver, you can work out what the anomaly is there. And then you can try to take the limit to the origin. And then you have additional constraints uh, you have to, that you have to consider. And then you can reconstruct the full anomaly. And it's been done in many ways. And it's been done both in the bulk. And it's been done also purely from field theory. Uh, I have some papers where I explain how this works in the bulk. Um, <laughs> But the focus will not be on the 60 theory, but the focus will be in trying to understand these 40 theories. Okay, good. Thanks for those questions. Okay, so the so so just so this you can sort of consider since I'm just even doing um, a, a compact a, a smooth Riemann surface, it is a sort of you know the simplest level of this problem, even before you think about punctures. Even at, at this level, if you try to compute the, so the, the, the anomaly, let's, let's take the anomaly polynomial of the 6D theory as given. If you just do this integral, you will get a lot of free field, just at this level. And, 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 and it's unclear how to get them. So, so which context where you can clearly see that you get free fields is, let's consider the case where we have a genus one, so we have a torus, so this story has been studied in, 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 in a couple of ways. 
There were the papers a time ago I wrote with myself, Tajikawa, uh, uh, the math that we make people on this Hanani. And uh, uh, and Mariyoshi. Maria. So we so this problem at this level, where you just take the 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 genus one case, just try to study this thing carefully, um, it, it's been done. And there's various interesting observation. Um, first, you just want to integrate this anomaly polynomial on the torus. When you're doing it on the torus, there are some subtleties that you have to account for, but 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 but, but we can. Um, also, the reason why at this level this is interesting is because there was a proposal by by Davide and and, and Shlomo on on having building blocks for for these theories. So there is there are some Trinian constructions. What are called Trinian constructions, where you consider a three punctured sphere, and then you study the 6D theory on, on this space. You can, you can consider such as Trinians, where, where this has something called a minimal puncture and two maximal punctures. Um, so, so these trinians, you can construct them, and they're really made of chiral fields, four-dimensional chiral fields. So, one thing you can try to then do is you can take two of these trinians and glue them together in some prescription, which 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 are known. And then, when you do this, you actually construct Lagrangian series because you have uh, trinians which can you can model with some chiral fields. When you glue, you can construct some Lagrangian theory. What's the meaning of the statement that you have something? Guarantees. Meaning that you can, so for example, so one that you're familiar with, you, you have the three punctured sphere for a, a trinian associated to a, a 6D theory on, 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 on this space where you get uh, this quiver where it's a hypermultiplet by fundamental. So in, 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 in the one zero case, uh, because you're, you, you have to do this orbifold, what you end up getting. It, so here you have really two fields, one going this way and one going that way. What you get is something that looks like this. Where you get arrows that, that are like this. So you get some, some you, you, is this the, the number, how, how long this is, is given by K, the order of, of, of the orbifold. And then over here you have SUN boxes coming from taking the action of the orbifold. So you can construct quivers like this. This is circular. The last one is identified with the first. Um, so you can construct. So there's a so so in in a in a, in a, in a paper of uh, Radamat and 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 Gaiotto, there's a proposal of of this as the simplest trinian. It's not the general one. This is a system of free fields now. That's right. Okay, so, so the, the conjecture is that this uh, this zero theory and this puncture sphere and so on, when you float to the infrared, you got have a bunch of free fields. That's right. Okay. Yes. So there is so so you can take these things. So once you have a candidate for this, you can glue. You can take you, you can take two of tr two trillions of various kind. So this this would have a simple puncture, and you have a simple puncture, a maximal puncture, and then you can glue. By some prescription, and then you can also glue the outside one by some prescription. Then you're left with these uh, last last punctures, and then what you can do, you can Higgs them. You can Higgs that you want, and when you Higgs it, that closes the puncture and it makes it smooth. And the cost of Higgsing a puncture is that you, if you think of this geometrically, you have a localized singularity for the gauge field sitting there. It distributes the flux over. Over, over, over the surface, over the torus. So when you do this gluing procedure and then close these punctures by directly higgsing uh, 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 the symmetry, it becomes a sphere, but with a background flux turned on for some U1. Sorry, a torus with a background flux turned on for some U1. So, th so th there is, 
doing this, then you can study this specific reduction on, on, on a torus, and you, you have explicit 4D field theory realization of, of, of what you can get. Okay, so let, let me, so here is a nice context where I can highlight the, the, the problem. So, so here I consider the symmetry, I have a U1 times an SU2 times SU2. In this reduction, I can turn on a background flux here, which I will call N beta for the U1 carton here. And I can also turn on some background flux here and gamma, which, which for, 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 for this, and I can have a large family of them that I, that I can turn on. Um, in particular, if I just take the simplest one, the lowest level one in some units where n beta is n gamma, which is equal to one, you can ask what theory do you get in this case? The theory that you get in this case becomes the n equal to one clever enough Witten theory. Where you have some SUN uh, symmetry here, some SUN symmetry here, but not exactly the, 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 that. What you also get is when you do this, this, this procedure, you get an extra field, this, this, this free field, which in the literature sometimes is called the flip field. So you get the n equal to one Klebanoff theory where you get a deformation of the superpotential with respect to two free fields phi, which couples to baryons. Uh, I'll call you phi beta and B beta. And you get phi gamma and B gamma total. So you, so, so you end up getting the, the KF theory, but then you, you get two extra free fields. And these two extra free fields uh, from this construction, they explicitly couple to baryons, where you can think of B beta as just a determinant of Q, where Q is the chiral superfield here, similarly for B beta 12. Now, you can ask what are the charges of this field? You can, you can, you can describe this. So you, what do we have? We have a R symmetry prime, and here there's a specific choice of an R symmetry which is our symmetry that, that is just embedded in the SU2. There's a natural choice. You get a U1 beta, a U1 gamma that's coming from the, 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 the SU2 that are acting here. And then the charges here become two, two, you get N zero, zero, and minus N. Can you say that? But uh, these free fields kind of ensure that the baryon values are zero. So the, they, they do something even worse. They project out the, the baryons. Uh -huh. right. so on the mesonic branch, baryons are zero anyway, right? Yes. On the mesonic branch, baryons are zero anyway. But the superpotential, they actually, the F terms throw away the baryon. So it's doing something even worse. Um, and, 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 and when you compute the anomaly of the 4D theory by reducing I8 of the 60, actually what you get is the anomaly of the KF theory plus a term of associated to these three fields. So if you didn't know better and you took that anomaly polynomial and tried to compute the central charge, you actually get N to the three half scaling, okay? So everything seems to make sense, but these three fields are, are become quite important. And the reason why you can see that they're very important, if you look at their charges, is very large. Just a question. So I think in the basic conifold construction, the baryons came from these three brains wrapped over some good, good. cycle. So here, can you see that there are no three cycles? Um, I'll come back to this towards the end of the talk, and, and I will explain. Uh, this can you say again, so which space does the M5 brain wrap? So, so in this case, this is a space um, where the M5 brain is wrapped on the torus, and then it's sitting at the locus of a C2 mod Z2 singularity in M theory. Uh, so this reduction will give you the case. Here. 
Could you say again what the free fields are? Are you saying that phi and V are somehow the free fields? Yes. Here, here's why they're free fields. You, so if you have this description that you construct here, you should think of this description as some mesoscale along the flow that you provide. So these, uh, these uh, deformation are actually irrelevant. So in the deep IR, they, they, they go away. And then you truly have a system where you get the KS theory plus the two free fields. So, so this construction is some intermediate scale. So whenever we use this trinian construction, you should think of that as some intermediate scale. That's really not at the fixed point. And then that scale, then that flows uh, 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 further down. So in the deep IR, these will decouple and you go back to the, to the, to the KS theory, but you get KS cross free field. It is in this sense, I call them free fields. Oh, okay. So this, the, the free fields are the phi fields. The yes. Bs are part of the Yes, that's right. So, so, some, so somewhere in the middle, somehow the baryons are not part of the chiral ring, but then if you go to the fixed point, they're there. And there's a good physics why that is. Is this related to the U1s? I mean, there's also a discussion that sometimes in some brain construction, one starts from some UNs as opposed to S2Ns. No, no, these, these, these are not the U1s. Yeah. That's no relation. No, no, these are not the U1s, but, but yeah, that's a good question. But they are singlets, right? Yes. The yes, they're all they're, they're singlets under the SUN. Okay. And and here, so here we, we've they have charge two under R prime. R prime is a natural R symmetry that you pick from the 6D point of view. Uh, and from the 6D point of view, the baryons have zero R, R, R charge under R prime, but there is also uh, the, a perfect for that. Okay, so this is a simple case where you can see. Um, that, that, that if you try to reduce the anomaly formula simply from field theory, you have extra stuff you have to worry about. So you can, so in general, in this context where I take um, K equal to two, in general, you can, we, we, we show in our paper that if you take N beta to be P plus Q and N gamma to be P minus Q, then what you get is the YPQ theories with three fields. And the three fields, uh, you get order uh, and beta and order and gamma three fields. Right. So, so if you just do this, if you take the, the fluxes to be general, to be, to be this, then you get many, many, many free fields. How many order the, the same order as the number of fluxes? So, so you are very off. In fact, if you look at their contribution to the anomaly polynomial, they contribute terms that scale of n to the fourth. They completely dominate the anomaly polynomial, but they're just mostly free fields. So you have, so this is a case where, because we know what the answer, we have a Lagrangian construction, you can you can you can sort of you can write them down, but in general, if you are compactifying on a given Riemann surface, then this is a problem for which you don't know what the answer. You want to know how to get this correctly. Okay. Any questions? You said n that goes like n cube. This is the n of the SUN. The so. If n, so when I say n to the fourth, the assumption that the fluxes and n will can scale all at the same level, I said uh, the trigger um, mm -hmm. or, or, or just seeing here, you can see that you have u and beta go to n. So if you take, for example, uh, the, 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 the trace r cube, you get an n cube coming here. But then if there are n beta of them, you get n beta times n cubed, so you get many, you get a huge contribution. Yeah, no. Maybe not understand that, that, that diagram. So in that diagram, there was one field with charge n. Right? Yeah, good. So this, right, so this was the specific um, diagram for, the, for, for when I get the KS theory. When I do the general YPQ, I have a more interesting quiver. I have many more baryonic operators around. Um, I will get many fields. How many order n beta? So here I'm just getting two. Okay. 
And this two is correlated with the fact that, you know, the fluxes is one. But if I have the fluxes is large, then I have the same number, same order, the, the number of free field scales as the order of the flux that I turn on. So that this is why they contribute large quantities to the anomaly. So you have to know what they are. And, and, and it, so, it, so this is a context where, again, as I say, we have a Lagrangian construction, so we understand what to do. Um, but in general, if I consider an arbitrary Riemann surface with some genus G, then I don't know, I, I, there is no field theory analysis that I can do in the low energy to write down a Lagrangian and be able to determine them. So we want to understand what this is. And to do this, you have to go back to the geometric construction in, 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 in string theory. And this is what I will try to describe now. Good. So the picture so far you should have is if we think of think about this this theory where we start from the n m five brains, we considered a system where we we do a decoupling limit to some six d uh, SCFT here, and this six d SCFT. So we took some decoupling limit to some six d SCFT. And then from this decoupling limit, we, we, we try to flow down to a 4D. So this is a field theory flow here. This is a decoupling limit here. So this is a, what, what we've just done. However, you can imagine studying the same problem and try not to visit the field, field theory point, but can you, you can ask, can I just do a decoupling that goes directly to, some, to the 4D? Okay, this is a sort of more natural holographic perspective that you might want to take uh, uh, from this story. And, and what this means is <coughs> you, you would consider taking these end brains, wrapping some Riemann surface with some background flux, and then try to take some decoupling limit of that system and say, can I understand the 4D theory directly, okay? To, to study this problem, whether, whether, you, whether you have a, a, a decoupling, um, you do not need to, for example, construct the full uh, uh, back reaction of this problem. There is a more intermediate thing you can think about. If, if we take these brains, they, they, they're sitting in some locus. And on this locus, you, you, they're sitting in some locus at the tip of some cone here. So the world volume of the brains is going to be R13 times a sigma G. And then here, they're sitting onto some cone, which is going to be an R5 cone, which is a cone that you get by taking R and looking at the tip of this orbital. Okay. So if I want to now think about this problem, then what you get is you have a 4D theory on R13. And from an M theory point of view, uh, uh, you, you have the M-theory background split into this R13 times some M6, where M6 is going to be some internal space, okay? And that's going to play an important role. So now, if I just care about understanding the anomalies of this problem, then I can do an anomaly inflow onto the brains in this setup. So I can do anomaly inflow onto the brains, and the anomaly inflow should tell me what the directly should give me an answer to I6 associated to this, to this 4D theory. And this is the quantity that you would want to compute at this level to, to try to do to, to in, in going on this, this limit. Okay. So the problem 
of having a system of brains and then trying to do anomaly inflow onto that on, onto this this uh, onto those brains um, have been discussed in some papers of me in, in a series of papers of myself, uh, Federico. Uh, let me provide more details, and I can give a citation. Um, so let me give the answer first. So if you have any, let, consider some M theory background, and then you have some slice of the space. Let this slice can be some M D dimensional. So you have the transverse direction, which is going to be uh, K eleven minus D. And then you ask, given this, this, this slice, you can treat it as a boundary in M theory, right? So if you add a boundary in M theory, you can ask, uh, how do I preserve global the gauge symmetry of the, of, 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 of the bulk theory? So the, you can do this analysis where you can take the bulk supergravity theory, and then you do the, the general gauge transformation and ask how the gauge transformation fails to be preserved on the boundary. And then you figure out what you need to add on the boundary to preserve the full gauge symmetry. And that is the standard story of anomaly inflow. And the object that you add in the boundary is exactly going to be the anomaly polynomial of whatever degree of freedom that you wish to live on, 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 on such a boundary. Okay? So that's the general philosophy. And at the end of the day, there is a prescription on computing it directly. So in this context where, where I have an MD here, um, if I have, I want to obtain some, the anomaly is going to be summarized by some anomaly polynomial, which is of D plus two. And then you have, let's see, good, okay. You have this transverse space. This transverse space is going to, you can think of this as some cone that's sitting here. And along this cone, you have some sigma, some compact space here, which is going to be 10 minus D. Right? You have some compact space that's, 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 that's sitting there. The anomaly here, you can argue, is going to be given by some integral on, 10, on this space of 10 minus D of some polynomial, some 12 form polynomial. By the way, this is an analysis where D is always even, so to just keep in mind. So what is this object here? This object is, has its origin from the chern simons terms of, of M theory. It's given by some full form plus D4 H X8, one over six, okay? So I didn't explain full details. I just give you what the answer is. Um, and the way you can think of this, think of uh, what is happening here is I take M theory, I first reduce on the sections of this cone to get some supergravity theory. And then I look at that supergravity theory and then try to do inflow one dimension lower. It's also an equivalent way to do it. But all of these things give you the same answer that the anomaly theory that the, the captures the, that you can associate to the boundary theory is always constructible by taking some form that you integrate on this space. So this is work that's done by the So there is a similar analysis in type 2B that you can also do. So let me tell you how we unpack this result. Any questions? Okay. The next piece of data that I have to give you about this object is how to compute E4. What is this E4 and what, and what, and, and what is its meaning? So this form E4 is a equivariant 
completion of G4, okay? So the way we, you can think of this problem is if you have this tag of brains, in this case, this boundary, what we imagine putting is some M5 brains. So that your M5 brains is going to be supported by some four form flux that exists, okay? And then I have to take that four form flux and I want to gauge it over the full space time as if I'm trying to do a reduction to a supergravity. And in doing such a gauging, typically I'm forced to extend G4 to some E4 and E4 is what I will call some equivariant completion. Gauging, what is the gauging? So let me, let me, I'll explain that now. So suppose we have a construction, let's pick the example that we want here where, where we have, where we're looking for some 4D theory on coming from M5 brains on some Riemann surface sigma G. Then the prescription there is telling me that I have to obtain I6 by integrating on sigma, whatever this I12 is, okay? This is what this prescription is telling me. Uh, sorry, integrating on M6, whatever this, this, uh, this thing is. So what is M6 here? So M6 is something that sits on the Riemann surface and on the fiber has the S4 that surrounds the brain, not particularly S4, but S4 mod ZK. Okay, so you take the sphere that surrounds the brain, you're fibering this over the Riemann surface, this is what makes M6. So now if I want to think about this total space M6, that generically what I expect to happen when I have this type of brains is I have a full form G4 on M6, which is going to have, for example, N times V4, where this is the volume of sphere, Okay, but then because you have this larger space, you can also have terms which are going to be some fluxes n i times omega four i, where omega four are the four forms in this space m six, and then you can have if you if omega if m six has two cycles then we know that the fluctuations of those two cycles will give you some gauge symmetry and that gauge symmetry becomes a global symmetry in the field theory. So you would get terms that are background fields times some two forms and on and on. So, so this would be the general form of G4 that would support such a thing. And you have the original N, which is of the five brains, and then you have a bunch of flux of NIs. So what we mean here by an equivariant completion is, suppose we take this V4, right? So let's take some simple model of V4. It is, it is the fourth sphere, which has two, 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 two directions. So we can have write in something like D mu one, wedge D mu two with some coefficient function here, wedge the two circles on the sphere, D phi one, D phi two. So these two circles are going to be isometry directions on, 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 this, on, this, on this fourth sphere. And these isometry directions are going to give me symmetries in the supergravity and therefore symmetries for the field theory. So this will encode the R symmetry in the original U1 that I want. So when I, in supergravity, when we reduce this, we want to gauge it by turning on some background field Right. And then when we reduce with this choice of a background field, then this will give me the effective action for these guys. Okay. So the, the, the issue now, however, is G4, if we, do, if we extend G4 onto the full space by gauging, so, so we need to do similarly for all of these forms. You can have a local description for all of these forms, and all of them are going to depend on the various isometries, so you have to also gauge them. But now when you gauge them, you immediately observe that the G4 will not satisfy its Bianchi identity in the full space, it's not closed. And in, 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 and in order to close it, 
you have to add terms that are going to be, for example, F1, which something, F2, which something, and then you can have terms which are F1, which F2, and on and on. So this is what we mean by doing some equivariant completion of G4. Okay. Can you say again what omega four i was? Omega four i. I'm wrapping this. Are elements of H four M. You can quantize. Okay, and they are like geometrically you wrap the sigma and you wrap the, the two cycles that you get from blowing up the singularity. Is the good. Same. Good. So good. So, so this is where we're going. With this, okay. So, so, so this was to just summarize how you construct this E4. So now, for the problem of interest, we want to explicitly construct this. And the claim is, once we construct E4 and plug into this formula, we get the anomaly, uh, the anomaly polynomial for any theory that I obtain by doing this compactification. Okay. Any questions? Okay, so let's go back to the problem. So if we go back to, to now the, the problem of the one zero theory, where we have M5 uh, probing the C2 mod ZK singularity, uh, the, 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 the space time near the brains is going to be R13 times an M6, and M6 here, as we've described, I will is a, is a vibration of some 4D space times sigma. So I'll describe what this 4D space is. This 4D space, since we are in supergravity, you should take it as taking S4 mod ZK with some re resolution. Okay. Which is exactly as Lawrence was predicting what will happen. So pictorially, what, what I'm going to do, so I have the sphere, and at the poles of the sphere, I have some, some, some singularities sitting there, here, which locally, this is going to be uh, R4 mod VK. Okay. So I can consider a resolution of this. So I'll do a generic resolution where I have the arcs of the sphere, but now at the poles, I can just model it as some given Hawking space. So I resolved it by replacing the singularities with some with some with some two cycles. So I can just take R mod ZK. It's a K-centered given Hawking space. I can I know how to resolve that. Okay. So now in this diagram here, I can ask what is the cohomology? So, so this was this singular space times sigma. So here I have this space times sigma. I have, uh, give the answer 2k minus one, two forms, okay? And then you also have 2k minus one uh, all forms omega i two, and you can think of these roughly as taking omega two i times sigma. Okay. So this doesn't give you all, there is one more, and that one more is the, the, the volume of the sphere itself. So, so, so already this counting should, look, should, should, should be familiar from the original 6D theory, which I have now erased. Good. So, so now once I give you this data here, 
uh, I can just go ahead and compute, construct the generic G4, which would be N times V of the F4. Then you have a sum I equal to one to K minus one times N I omega I, omega four I, where these are these four forms here. You have one in the north, in the North Pole, and then you have another in the South Pole of the same. And then we also know that from these resolution two cycles, if I take the four form flux wrapped around each one of these resolution two cycles, I get some U1. And these U1s is exactly the Cartan elements of the original SUK times SUK symmetry for the one for the one zero theory. So to include those, I also have a sum fi times omega i. And these are, you can think of now, from the point of view of the, of the field theory, these are background fields. Of SUK flavor symmetry. <clears throat> And then when I proceed to do the equivariant completion as I described here, these forms all gets replaced with some more complicated object, which also includes the background field for the R symmetry and also the extra flavor you want. And when I obtain this E4, I can then plug into this formula and integrate down on the Riemann surface. And this would give me my anomaly polynomial as I want. Any questions? Okay, so I mean, actually, in this computation here, uh, what this thing gives you the, doing this analysis so far. So, if if you remember, I twelve had two terms. There is an E four cubed plus another term, which is E four wedge x eight, where x eight is uh, is 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 uh, P two of the tangent bundle minus four P1 squared of the M theory tangent bundle. You also have to work to decompose this term appropriately, but you can do this, okay? Um, so the claim is once you do all of this and you plug here and integrate down on, 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 on this space, uh, you, you, you compute, you, 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 you recover the anomaly. So in, in terms of the talk, the Lorentz talk last week, you can imagine that in doing this integral here, that you'll have pieces that localize onto the cycles. So this is going to be uh, the equivariant localization. And the reason why that's happening is, if you remember this S4 with orbifold, if you go to the poles, the R symmetry is shrinking, which is the isometry, and that's sort of going to localize you to these, to these bubbles. It's similar. Okay. Okay, so let me now give you what the answer is, and then I can tell you the physics of what you get from it. Okay, so <clears throat> on one hand, as we've done, so we've we've had M five uh, probing uh, the C two mod Z K. So first, we consider this. It goes down to six D here, where there are two contributions that happens in six D. One is the six D 
one zero theory here. And then over here, you would get something like a free tensor and free 6D vectors. So the free tensor is a decoupling mode of the brains, and then the, ten the free vector is the fact that you have an orbifold with an SUK flavor symmetry. In type 2A, you can think of those as D6 brains where you have to decouple the center of the, the, the vector that live on the D6 brain. And then we further reduce this thing, and it has two contributions. This will have <coughs> one contribution, which I will call the 4D free fields. And then over here, it will have a contribution, which is the 4D and equal to one SCFT. Okay, so this, so this will have, each one of these will have some anomaly polynomial associated with them. This is I6 V vector and tensor. Over here, I will call this I6 three. And then we do the analysis where we have M5 probing flux background, which is doing this analysis here. So this will have two contributions. One of them is going to give me directly the 4D theory. And then there'll be another contribution here, which is going to taking uh, 6D free tensor and free vectors reduced on sigma g. So this will have some contribution, which I will call I6 dt. Okay. And at the end of the day, we obtain the following formula, and I will then I will justify how we get it. We have I6 inflow, which is what we get from doing the inflow analysis, minus I6 vector tensor. This is equal to I6 from field theory, right? Field theory meaning what we get by reducing the 6D down to four dimensions. And then this will have I6 free, right? And this is the part that we want to now get rid of, okay? So because we have an independent computation of this, this thing we can just compute because we know what free tensors and vectors are when you reduce them on a Riemann surface. We have a computation of this by just doing the standard field theory anomaly matching. So the difference is going to give us I3. So could you say again, what was the field theory one? So the field theory one is the one that you get by just taking I8 and integrating that. So this difference of the, this, this whole thing is equal to the I6 of the CFT? Yes. Yes, so this is I6 of CFT. <clears throat> Why is there a minus sign in front of the info? It's, it's minus sign because what we compute when we do that, that integral is what we what we're computing is actually the anomaly of the bulk gauge for gravity, right? So this is minus the. Um, so sorry, it's it's not important. It's just a notational leftover from. <laughs> I do not understand why you need to compute these vectors. You you describe them as living on the D six brains, but the D six brains live in one more dimension, right, in seven dimensions. Uh, uh, sorry, good. So, so here, when I reduce it, I have five brains probing this singularity, yeah. right? So this singularity, um, you know, I, I can just take M theory on the singular space. What I would get is the gauge theory, <laughs> right? And, 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 and then I put the brains and I localize, so then I get the gauge theory. But yeah, the, 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 the sixth brain was just another way to see. It's really the decoupling modes because this is because I put brains in a in a in a supergravity which has this symmetry. And the point is that in, in this analysis here, so here when you compute the anomaly polynomial at the level of six D, you have to subtract this here. They're, 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 they're still there. But but in doing the analysis here, 
these three tenths, these things are, are, are still there. These are five brains probing the supergravity background. So those things are still there, but you still have to subtract them downstairs, but not a 6D object, but a 4D object. So you reduce them on. So I realize I didn't understand your answer. So the, the, the C2 mod CK lives in seven dimensions, right? Yes. The, the theory we're interested in lives just in six dimensions. That's right. I thought that these uh, vectors should not play any role, that the ones that live in seven dimensions. The, 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 the reason why we subtract them is even in 6D, when we're computing the anomaly polynomial of the 6D theory, we're still doing inflow in that 7D supergravity background. Uh, so it's an inflow of contribution. Yeah. So even at the, in 6D, when we compute the anomaly of the of the of the five brains, we, if we're still doing this anomaly inflow, taking the 7D gauge supergravity, where you have the five brains sitting at some locus and doing an inflow there. And so you, you were doing this inflow. This whole discussion you had here was for computing the inflow. Yeah. So this whole discussion is computing the, the inflow directly down to 4D, where you where you get a 5D supergravity and then. But then, then if you wait, when you the, the first term that has the inflow, you could also resolve the spheres and so on, and that's equivalent to the second term. So it is that. So this first term here. There are you resolving the singularities and stuff like that or not? Yes, there I'm resolving the singularities, taking the full. Uh, uh, so I would think that any vectors that you're talking about would already be included there. Um. Mm -mm -mm. The, 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 so good. So any vector that I'm talking about, they would contribute here. Why? Why then you include them again? Or ah, I have to subtract their contribution to get the correct CFD. Right, but 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 it's not the contribution of the full vector, but the contribution of the vectors on the Riemann surface. Oh, sorry, on the on the on the yes, on the Riemann surface from which I'm reducing. Uh, we can we, I can explain in, in a little bit more detail, but 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 manifestly this is a term that you have to subtract off, which 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 so 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 if I didn't if I were just having a flat brain, D3 brain, so anything like this. Even whenever I do an inflow in such an object, you 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 agree that they're the center of mass mode that I have to subtract. So this so these are you these are exactly play the same role, but they it's just a more complicated uh, space. They're, they're just modes that live in the supergravity which you're using to do your inflow and out. Okay, so the. The claim is you, if you compute this, you subtract this, you compute this, you, you get the, the, the CFT answer. Um, so, so this and supergravity, they lead to topological modes in the supergravity theory. That that's right. And the boundary of the space and not yes. the color of the space. Yes. 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 So the yes. So the 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 anomaly form that I wrote earlier was a topological term. Okay, so the so if you now look at this difference, then you you have an assignment of what what this i six three is, and then you can then try to study what 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 is this term. A priori, you have no idea whether this corresponds to free fields or not, but the claim is it is, and I can actually describe it explicitly what they are uh, after some work with the anomaly polynomial. So what you get is in the north part of the pole, you have some free, some fields that are called phi AB. I'll use this label AB. They will all have R charge two. So I have this U1 beta I, which is one of the Cartan U1s from the north pole. You will have some some charges which I will call L A B I. This would be zero. I have U1 gamma in the south pole, which would be zero. There's a minus N L I A B. 
Uh, then the other useful data that I have to tell you here, there is some multiplicity. And this multiplicity is non-trivial, is a given in terms of the fluxes, is n beta output a label A here, minus n beta A minus one, n beta D minus plus n beta D minus one. And then there is a similar expression here where it's, 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 it's not full. So the point is that if I look at the difference of that I3, uh, if you work hard enough, you can find that there are anomalies for free fields which have these charges. The LAs here are, are positive roots of the SU, of the, the components of the positive roots of the SUK algebra. So let me give that. So L A B I is L A I minus L B I. And L A I is delta A I minus delta A. There is a positive, uh, there are components of the positive roots of the SUK algebra, so which, which is appearing, and that's what determines the charges of these three fields in this case here. Okay. So, so this is the answer that you get. So then you ask, where does this answer come from? Why, 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 why is it there? If you notice by construction over here, you are free to, so with, since this has R charge two, it implies that you always have some operators phi AB times some operator that you can multiply it, BAB in, 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 at the level of the 4D. So the question you could ask is what are then these operators that, 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 are, that, are, that are showing up here? The next thing you can do, since we're out of time, I'll just explain how this works, is uh, as Igor was pointing out earlier, the, 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 the baryons, uh, we know them in various contexts as coming from, D, in type 2b as coming from wrapped D3 brains, for example. So here you have two cycles here. On each cycle, you can think about wrapping some M2 brains. Okay. So if you consider wrapping an M2 brain on each cycle, then this is going to give you a, an operator, which is localized in R13 times the Riemann surface sigma g. So you get an operator every time for each one of these two cycles, you can wrap an M2 brain, and then each M2 brain is going to be some operator. And if you, you can then go ahead and write down the effective theory of such an upper up, up to them two brains, and you can compute all of the charges of the of the them two brain operators. And when you compute for all of those charges, you find that the charges up to them two brains organize themselves exactly in this way with a minus sign. And with zero, why is it zero? Why do why do them two brains have zero R charge? It's because they're going to be sitting at a locus where the U1 R symmetry is shrinking, which is at the north poles and the south poles of the S4. So the M2 brains that you get there would be neutral under R1 un, under R prime, but then by reducing their action, you find that they will be charged under the various U1s that you get here. And those charges are exactly the ones that are opposite to these phi's, such that they, they can make a superpotential term. Okay, so, so, so that's nice. Then the, you can ask, okay, so now you can, for every choice of a charge of a scalar phi, you can associate some M2 brain. Then the question is, what about the multiplicity? So you have this large number here. So where is that coming from? And this goes back to the physics of thinking about the Riemann surface here, since the M2 brain is a point particle, with my color chalk, since the M2 brain is a point particle here, you remember that there was a flux, there's a, there's a flux here, which is sitting times, which, is, which was an I, 
times omega i times sigma g v sigma g you have these four 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 form fluxes that are appearing so if i reduce the world volume theory of the m2 brains on on these two cycles i integrate on these two cycles but then what you get is a point particle that's sitting on a riemann surface with flux with a magnetic flux then there's a landau bubble And this Landau level is exactly given by the flux and I. So even though I compute one M2 brain here, there's a degeneracy given exactly by this NI. And this NI, under the various mapping that you have to do between the field theory and the geometry side, exactly reproduces this multiplicity here. OK? So you're calling A is somehow the index I? Yeah, so A is related to the index I in a non-trivial way. Because the, the point is, is that when you're looking at the field theory, you, you just break the SUK. It's, it's some random breaking. There's no reason why it should be special from the point of view in the geometry. So when you do the analysis of the geometry, there's a basis transformation that you have to do, and that's non-trivial. So when you compute it in the field theory, you get an answer. And then you compute it in the gravity, the fluxes, you get some answer. And the Landau level gives you the degeneracy. And when you work out the map, you find that this guy exactly maps to this guy. Right. So then you 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 then the statement is now you this sort of scheme allows you to compute the 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 the, the decoupled fields or the thing that you would call accidental symmetry along the flow from 6D to 4D. Um, and, and the role of what they do, they seem to be projecting out some M2 brain operators along the flow. But now this is where you can understand what the physics of what's going on. So T M2 brain exists in the level at the 4D as exactly being blow up modes associated to this resolution cycle. But when we go back to the 6D theory you, and where we decouple the brains when, when they probe in the 6D theory, it is actually known that there is no blow up modes in the 6D theory. Meaning if I try to introduce any blow up modes in the 6D theory, this would correspond to turning on FI terms, which would break the Lorentz symmetry. Okay. So what this means is that this sort of irrelevant operators that you, that you observe in the intermediate that, 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 that involve these scalars, you, sh you should think of them as interpolating terms. They're interpolating from the physics of the 6D theory to the physics of the 4D. In the 6D theory, these modes aren't there, but in the 4D, they're there and they correspond to the baryonic operators. So the role of these decoupling fields is exactly to sort of do this physics, to interpolate for you from the 6D to, 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 to the 4D. Okay, I think I'll stop here. If I understand correctly, in the gravity side, I can see the baryons, right? Yes. Um, but I cannot see the phi. So, uh, so from the gravity side, so so the, the phi basically are masked up. They're masked, they're masked up and thrown up. That's, 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 that's what ends up happening. I thought that the, the, the pits would be free and the pits, massless pits. Yes, from the field theory analysis, I see them as massless field. But from the gravity side, because the reason why they're not contributing to the anomaly polynomial is because I've resolved the two cycles, and that gives them mass. So, so you, that throws them away. So it's a mass in the bulk, but somehow there should be yes. the boundary. Somehow there is an extra massless model. Yes. And this sort of ge should generalize in many of the contexts where we see these three fields appear uh, in, in, in various things. This is also the same, because you have these three fields, but also the same reason why, when we knew about A maximization, why A maximization couldn't be the proof for the A theorem, because you didn't know how to account for the three fields. But in this context, uh, you know, be, just doing by the geometric analysis, you can follow the three field. A maximization actually proves the A theorem. I remember examples where you 
continue the theory, right? And somehow at some point it spits out these three. And there are such. Yeah, this, yeah, there, there are examples where, where you can do, where, where this well, can happen. Continue as a function of some parameters and then you reach some confusing point and then it, there is this free sector that splits. Up. Which context was this? I vaguely remember, I mean, there was this work by Kutasov, Barnachov and so Oh, yes, yes, yes. That, that yes. stuff like this. And we actually wrote a paper about 3D dualities, which is called a crack in the conformal window. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> and that had something like that, like some free fields spit out and that results some confusion. Yeah, yeah, and I think this is, in a sense, in, in that same an analysis like that. But, but, but the point is, you're doing it at the level of the of the central charges. Oh, sorry, mm -hmm. of the anomaly polynomial. You just mm -hmm. as long as you provide two different ways of computing the anomaly polynomial, then you have a chance of seeing of seeing three D. Uh, there is no anomaly polynomial, of course, no. but there is some other. I mean, there is a Sarani duality, right? And like we looked at it with Ben Safdi and. A student and, uh, about 10 years ago, and there was some confusing stuff that happened at this crack, and then these three fields they show up here. Okay. Yeah, maybe I will take a look. I'm not, I'm not familiar. I'm not super familiar. There is a closer thing to actually compare it to, to your paper. So if you look at the n equal to two versus n equal to one, um, uh, uh, you have the adjoint. The, the scalar in the adjoint, right. which 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 is its free mode yeah. that, that goes away when you try to go to n equal to one. That fits at the singular. Yeah, that's, that's exactly. So this 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 is a sort of an example of that. This is exactly an example of that. Yes, yeah, some mode localized at the uh, mm -hmm. singularity of priority space. Yeah, yeah. This is an example of that, where it's now it, instead of coming from the n equal to two to n equal to one flow, it's coming from the sixty to the 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 forty the from the sixty to the forty forty flow, uh, but but there also is the same right. It's a, it's you've resolved this, and so now you have baryonic operators that show up in the n equal to one theory. Oh, thanks. I think I'm way over time.